All right, so I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name's Tom. Uh, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, this session is about insider threat. Uh, to give you like just a quick uh, overview, I'm going to talk first of all about how big a problem insider threat is, uh, because that seems to be uh, a question that a lot of people have. Um, is this really something that we need to be paying attention to or not? Uh, secondly, um, basically what are different ways of, I'm going to focus on, on monitoring as opposed to prevention. I'll talk a little bit about prevention, but I'm mostly going to talk about detection. Uh, so I'm going to talk about different ways of accomplishing that and what the trade-offs are. Um, and then uh, I'm going to, uh, one of the key things about detection is that um, it needs to be sort of driven by external uh, factors. So I'm going to talk about who commits these uh, crimes and, and why they do it. Uh, and that helps you uh, sort of constrain uh, the amount of, of monitoring you have to do to detect them because you can zero in on things that, that uh, uh, where you're likely to find something. Uh, and then uh, um, I'll go through some specific guidance. So why insider threat? Um, I think that uh, uh, insider threat is a subject that is dominated um, by uh, both mythology and fear. Uh, on the mythology side, you know, I, I, I've been working on computer security and talking about computer security for many years, and usually it's vulnerability-centric. It's about identifying security vulnerabilities and fixing them or blocking attacks that target them. Uh, and, um, you know, most of that has to do with uh, external threat actors, uh, people building botnets, stuff like that. And there's always that guy who says, you know, that's nice and all, uh, but the insider threat is the most important one or the most significant one or the most common source of attack activity. Uh, and it's like, well, is it? How do you know that? Uh, um, you know, those, those assertions always come with a, this authority, but they never come with an actual reference to some statistics. Uh, um, on the other hand, uh, we also have fear. Um, uh, you guys know uh, executives tend to be driven uh, uh, by what's happening in the news media. You know, something will happen in the media and then uh, uh, related to computer security, and then you'll see all these executives start asking questions about, well, are we protected against that? Do we have a solution for that? Um, and certainly the WikiLeaks uh, uh, case has been, uh, you know, widely reported. Um, uh, lots of people have been talking about it, and it's driven discussions uh, in lots of organizations about, uh, well, what if somebody who works here takes all of our information and sends it to that guy? What, what's going to happen? So, uh, you, you know, again, that's not necessarily rational. It's driven by what's happening in the news media, uh, but it does tend to uh, create this question for those of us who work in information security, irregardless of, of uh, um, you know, the, the likelihood that that event is actually going to occur in our environments. So mythology and fear. Uh, another thing that I think is important uh, is cynicism. Um, I, I did not uh, see uh, Josh Corman speak at B-Sides SF, uh, but I heard that he was quoted as saying uh, that cynicism was our core competency in, in, in InfoSec. Uh, and I kind of think that that's a reasonable um, observation. Uh, we are very cynical. And, th and the reason is that we live in this world that's dominated by mythology and fear all the time, and, and we just get kind of sick of it. Uh, and so when people say, oh, insider threats are a big deal, uh, you know, it's easy to say, no, they're not. Uh, and so um, uh, sometimes that pendulum might swing too far in the other direction. Uh, and so the first part of this talk is, is let's, let's discuss what data sources we actually have uh, that address this issue. So probably the most trusted data source right now uh, about computer security incidents is the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. Uh, and I hear this statistic get quoted at me a lot. Uh, you want to talk about insider threats? It was only 4% of the uh, Verizon deburn in 2012, so it's not a big deal. Uh, um, and that, that's, a, uh, that's a data point. It's important. Um, if you look at the history of the Verizon uh, data breach incident report, um, in 2011 it was 17%, and in 2010 it was 48%. Uh, so if we were having that same conversation two years ago, uh, the, the statistic would have led to very different conclusions. Um, and the reality is that what's going on with insider threat hasn't changed radically in two years. Um, Verizon says that they're working the same number of insider cases uh, that they have been working throughout this entire period of time, uh, but the number of external incidents that they've been working has increased. Uh, maybe that's because they've become more successful at selling that service. I don't know. Uh, there's lots of ways to slice this data. Um, 
Another thing that, that I think is interesting about the 2012 data uh, is that if you look at the incidents that were hacking, and I don't know what percentage of their total incident uh, load was hacking, uh, it's most of, but not all of those incidents, 3% uh, involved SQL injection. Uh, SQL injection's kind of a big deal. We spend a lot of time uh, trying to find SQL injection vulnerabilities and fix them and protect networks against them. Uh, um, you know, but you know, based on this statistic, you might argue that, uh, oh, it's irrelevant. Uh, we should be focusing on, on stolen credentials instead. Uh, and I'll talk about stolen credentials a lot later on in this talk. So, um, uh, you know, based on this piece of data, what this basically tells me, if I'm gonna accept the 2012 number, is that insider threat incidents don't happen as often as external attacks. Uh, maybe they're a small percentage of the total incident load. Uh, but there are other ways of asking this question. Another question you might ask is, how many organizations faced an insider-based attack? Uh, and this, this uh, chart comes from uh, Potamon, uh, who are pretty well respected uh, surveyors of, of uh, uh, InfoSec uh, um, organizations. And they talked about like what kind of breaches organizations experience. And, and what I think is interesting is that the top categories are, first of all, employee negligence, and secondly, system error or malfunctions. Uh, these are the reasons that breaches happen, that data was lost. Uh, um, uh, external attacks and malicious insiders are, are uh, far less common. Uh, however, if you take a look at external attacks and malicious insiders, uh, in malicious ins so more than half of the organizations that say that they faced an external attack also say they faced a malicious insider. Uh, so uh, that's a much more common uh, uh, place number. So what that tells me is that um, uh, the incidents themselves are not that common, uh, but w a wide variety of organizations may have faced them. So how expensive are they? What are the consequences of them? Uh, so a CERT um, CC has been doing research on insider threat for about 10 years. Uh, and they've got um, a, an interesting a database of 700 insider threat cases that were actually prosecuted. Uh, and um, they, they, so it's very similar to the Verizon data set in that sense. Uh, and, and they've got some statistics here on the, the, the actual cost of these incidents. And you can see that the median values are actually really small. 50,000 bucks for IT sabotage, uh, 300,000 for IP theft. Uh, but the average uh, losses are really high, uh, 13 million for IP theft. Uh, and so what that ends up looking like is a power law curve. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, where you have a whole bunch of cases that don't uh, uh, result in, in that much loss, and then you have a few cases up here that are really, really expensive, and it drives the average value uh, fairly high. Um, so uh, you guys all came to this session because you're interested in insider threat. Uh, if you don't have a copy of this book, uh, you should get a copy of it. Uh, um, so CERT has been doing research on this subject for uh, about 10 years, and last year they published a book that summarizes their research. It's my uh, computer security book recommendation for this year, certainly. Uh, and, and what I think is interesting about it is that we're beginning to move beyond uh, all this mythology and all these assumptions that people make, and we're starting to talk about how to manage this problem uh, um, based on empirical evidence and, and actual scientific data. So. Um, that's what's great about this research set. Uh, and they do a good job of making uh, their data into actionable advice. They tell you uh, what you should do to manage the problem based on the cases that they've looked at. Um, so going back and looking at these, these pieces of data, what we learn is that insider attacks do not occur frequently relative to external attacks. However, uh, reasonably uh, healthy uh, uh, cross-section of organizations do face them. So you might get one out of the 10 uh, incidents that you're managing. Uh, and they're usually not very costly, but in some cases they can be very expensive. Uh, and so that last part is a little bit difficult to, uh, to deal with from a, from a risk management standpoint. It's like how much money should you invest in dealing with this problem? It becomes really hard to decide that when you have this kind of curve uh, because uh, you know, that there, there may be a relatively remote risk of this incident occurring, but if it occurs, uh, the cost is, is really, really high. Uh, so there, there's one other variable that I want to throw in here that's relevant to that, this, or to this discussion, and that is this. Uh, so the Mandiant M-Trends report uh, talks about um, advanced persistent threat cases that Mandiant has worked. Uh, and they say that in 100% of those cases, the bad guys used valid credentials uh, and that malware was only installed on 54% of the compromised systems in those cases. So, and I mean, those of you who've worked on cases like this, um, 
you know, this is, uh, these pieces of data are probably familiar. The first thing that happens when these things occur, when, when the attacker gets on the network, is typically they go after access credentials. They attack the Active Directory server. Uh, and they, they, get some, they get some access credentials and then they come back in like over the VPN or something like that and they log in as, as a legitimate user in the network. Uh, and so then they become very difficult to track. You've got all these security solutions that are looking for malware, they're looking for, for exploits, um, but it's very difficult to tell, uh, it's very difficult to find this guy. Uh, uh, the guy who's logged into your network um, but isn't the person that he is supposed to be. Uh, and so if you've been keeping track, we have three kinds of, of insiders we need to be concerned with. Uh, one, and probably the most common problem, is negligent insiders, people who have access to data and are going to leave it on an airplane. Uh, two are malicious insiders, people who have access to data and they're going to sell it to somebody else because they hate you. Uh, and three are compromised insiders. Uh, it, it's, it's someone who's logged into the network who isn't who they're supposed to be. Um, and the question is, what do we do about all three of these problems? I want to digress briefly about compromised insiders. I think that the issue of compromised insiders um, and the issue of sophisticated targeted attacks is causing some change in the way that people think about how to manage computer security problems. Uh, for a long time, computer security problems have been about uh, prevention and about plugging vulnerabilities. You know, the first thing you do is you audit your network, you find vulnerabilities, uh, you try to patch them. Uh, you may have some IPS or something else that's a WAF that's going to block attacks that target certain vulnerabilities that exist. And if you fail, if you have an incident, if you have a breach, the first question you ask is, well, what should I have done to prevent that from happening in the first place? Uh, should I have, is there a vulnerability that was exploited that I should have patched that I failed to patch? Uh, and how can I create a new business process to ensure that that breach does not, ha that kind of breach does not happen again? And so, when, when you're talking about these sophisticated targeted attacks and you're getting hit with um, a zero-day vulnerability that uh, you know, is not going to have a patch for, for many, many months, uh, and, and maybe it's been crafted such that it evades your, your IPS system, the reality is that there is no business process that you could have put in place that would have prevented that attack from being successful. Uh, you're simply not going to be able to block some of these things from getting in in the first place. Uh, and so. Um, investing more in prevention at the perimeter is not necessarily going to help. Uh, and so this causes a, a, a shift in focus toward incident response itself as being part of how you protect your environment. Uh, and I, I, I think that um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is further investment in perimeter protection cannot prevent future incidents. Another thing is that once these things are in, it's not People think about breaches in a black and white way. Well, I got breached, so now it's game over, I lost. Uh, but when you're dealing with these persistent attacks, these guys are in your network for the long haul. And if you can find and disrupt what they're doing, even if you don't do it on day one, it's still a constructive thing to do. Uh, and so there's value in disrupting attacks that are ongoing in your environment. Uh, and so it makes sense to, to try to find them and hunt for them. Uh, the third point is that uh, threat intelligence about past breaches can be used to detect future attacks. So the way that you detect targeted attacks is from the things that you learn by investigating the incidents that you've already um, experienced. Uh, and so doing this sort of incident response and investigation is actually the way that you protect your network from future incidents. Uh, and so the, the focus moves from prevention to incident response as being the way that you, the way that you protect your network. So let's talk about uh, these three classes of insiders uh, and, and uh, you know, sketch out some of the things that you can do uh, to deal with them. Uh, talking about negligent insiders, um, I, I think really you, it's about prevention. Um, and, and like I said, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time in this talk on that subject. Uh, obviously, access controls can help if you've uh, prevented people from having access to things they don't need access to, then that's useful. Uh, encryption of data at rest is useful. If they leave the laptop on the, on the airplane, then um, you may not have to disclose that it was lost. Uh, I, I also mentioned, so two other subjects. One is DRM. Um, I'm not a huge fan of DRM uh, as, a, as a security measure because I, I believe that uh, fundamentally it's a flawed concept. Uh, um, you know, if you want to subvert it, you're going to be successful at doing so. Uh, but if you're dealing with a context where you're just trying to keep honest people honest, uh, it could possibly be effective. Uh, because someone would have to go to the trouble of subverting it, uh, and if they're not going to do that naturally, then you would reduce the number of incidents that take place. Uh, 
Another one is education. There have been a couple of essays that have been published recently, one by Dave Vitell and the other one by Bruce Schneier, both people that I, I greatly respect, uh, that argue that user education is, is a waste of time, that's a waste of money. Uh, and I, I strongly disagree with these essays for a couple of different reasons. Uh, um, the, the, the idea, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, is that, is that any computer security control that is not 100% effective is, is, is not useful at all. Uh, so if you invest in end user education, inevitably there's some guy in the room that is not going to learn anything from your education. And so they're going to continue to click on phishing emails or they're going to continue to do things that are stupid. And so you're going to continue to get breached. Uh, and so um, you, you, you need to do something else because you haven't protected yourself that way. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think that it's, it's about the other side of the curve, the people who do learn something from what you've educated them about, the people who do change their behavior, uh, um, because the, the, the behavioral changes that they uh, engage in are useful to you, even though uh, some people are, are never going to get a clue. Uh, and so with respect to negligent behavior, that's definitely the case. You can reduce the number of incidents that occurred through user education, even though you can't fully eliminate them. Uh, in the case of phishing attacks and sophisticated attacks, uh, I think it's also the case that user education is valuable. Uh, be, even though some people are never going to get a clue and they're still going to click on those emails, others will, will, will be more suspicious of things that they get in the future and they'll tell you if they get something suspicious. Uh, and then you, you, that may be the only way that you detected a sophisticated attack because it's targeting O'Day and it's very sophisticated. So getting that detection is valuable even though um, you may miss other things. So I, I, I really think that user education is, is useful. Uh, so that's, that's the negligent insider. Let's talk about malicious insiders. There's some things you can do in terms of prevention, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Again, access controls matter. Uh, but um, uh, you, you, some of these things you, you can't necessarily prevent. You need to move on to detection. Because in this case, really, the bad guy already has access to the thing that he's going to steal. And so uh, um, you've got to consider uh, you know, how you can detect that theft. And of course, compromised insiders are all about detection. And again, this account has access to the things that it's going to, it's going to steal. So I have another observation here. I'm going to start by talking about this malicious insider problem, particularly detection. And I'll get to this at the very end. Uh, um, so with respect to malicious insiders, another observation is that in computer security, typically uh, we have this assumption that if a security control can be evaded, then it is not valuable. Uh, and that assumption comes from uh, the reality that um, deterrence doesn't work on the internet. Uh, if, you, if, you, um, if, if, you, if you know that someone committed an attack in the past, it's very unlikely that you will find them because they could be anywhere. Uh, and furthermore, um, uh, so if somebody comes up with a way of evading a technical control, they can embed it in code and they can distribute it, and now everybody's got it. And so uh, it can be spread around very quickly. Uh, but we don't apply this assumption to the world of physical security. Uh, if you go in that room, in the back there's some guys picking locks. Uh, we all still use locks that are readily picked. Uh, one reason is that uh, uh, if, if you have a lock on a door, someone's going to have to pick it, and it's going to take them some time, and they might get caught doing it. Uh, and and you, so you have the ability to actually reach the person uh, that's committing the attack, and, and the lock slows them down. Uh, and so the reality is that um, in, the, in the context of insider threat, the malicious insider is someone you have access to. They're not you know, somewhere in, in Eastern Europe hiding behind a network of proxy servers. And so it's possible for you to actually have a deterrence effect on them, uh, even though uh, um, uh, you, know, you, may use, you may be using technical controls that are not perfect. Uh, and so that, that's a completely different perspective uh, in certain respects uh, th than we usually consider when we're talking about computer security control. Uh, one point I, I, I want to make is that, is that deterrence, deterrence works better if, if, um, if you're not relying entirely on a, a technical control that has a very specific algorithm that somebody can know determinatively whether or not they can evade. If you've got a human being in the loop uh, that's, that's looking at data, um, there's a bit of fuzziness to, to what is going to be detected and what's not going to be detected. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to create the risk. Uh, that a certain kind of behavior might be detected in order to have a deterrent effect. So the other thing, and I alluded to this earlier, uh, is that um, if you're going to try to detect this kind of attack activity, um, you, you need to find a way to find this needle in a haystack um, of your uh, legitimate network activity that's happening in your environment. Um, so you've got to have a way of narrowing down the problem. 
Uh, you can't just decide that you're going to monitor everything in an attempt to detect insider attacks. It doesn't work that way. Um, and, and the way that you uh, narrow the problem down uh, is by interacting with the rest of the business. I think that honestly this, with respect to insider threat, this is the most important slide in this deck. Uh, and, and the point is that IT cannot be fully responsible for solving this problem. Uh, and, and that is a significant misunderstanding that a lot of organizations have. Uh, the the uh, computer security issues are seen as, as technical problems for engineers to solve. And the business expects IT to solve these problems. And so they, they, they see insider threat as just the same thing. They expect the IT department to do something about it. Uh, and when these breaches happen, they go to the IT department and say, why didn't you prevent this? Uh, but the fact is that the IT department cannot prevent this alone. Um, uh, there, there is a role to play for HR, there's a role for legal, and there's really a role for management. So um, from an HR perspective, the reality is that people who do this are most likely disgruntled, and chances are very good uh, that they, um, you know, that the organization knows that they're disgruntled, that they've had some interaction with their manager in, 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 in a context where the manager knows that they're, that they're angry. Maybe they've done something uh, in the office that lets people know that uh, you know that they're that they're sick of how things work around here, right? Um, uh, furthermore, uh, you know they're much more likely to 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 do something like this in the context where, the, like, it's around 30 days before and after they leave the company, either because they were terminated or because they quit. Uh, and and uh, you know it, it may happen in cases of stress. So if there's a merger or acquisition happening or some sort of organizational structure change, uh, that tends to stress people out and that can cause people to do things like this. So uh, there are narrow windows of time and specific people uh, that are at risk uh, for this kind of activity. And having information about who is potentially at risk is how you can narrow down monitoring to the point where you can look for something where you're likely to find it instead of monitoring the entire organization all the time. Uh, furthermore, the fact is that if somebody is disgruntled, it is much better that the situation be de-escalated through effective management uh, than, than they you know, decide to do something on the computer network and now they've committed a crime. Uh, mostly these situations are things that, that good managers can de-escalate. Uh, if they identify them and, and handle them through soft skills. So like going to the IT department and saying, I need you to pull records on Bob and what he's been doing on the network should be the last stage when everything else has failed. Uh, um, from a legal standpoint, um, there are a number of issues. The first is that uh, if you do decide that somebody has committed some kind of crime in the organization, you need the legal department to be willing to support you in, in uh, creating some consequences for that person. Otherwise, it's, a, it's all a waste of time. Uh, and at the same time, the legal department needs to ensure that the things that you are doing are, are, um, are fair. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this later, but um, uh, you know, there, there are legitimate workplace privacy issues involved, uh, and, and there are also uh, um, really cultural issues involved. Uh, if you approach this problem as a bastard operator from hell and you don't respect people's privacy, um, you, you can create uh, the kinds of problems that you're actually trying to solve. So, um, the legal department, uh, to a certain extent, is there to make sure that um, you know where you're uh, doing something like monitoring someone's activity on the on the network, uh, that that is is done in a consistent way, um, and uh, um, you know it's done on the basis of some sort of uh, uh, you know reasonable suspicion, and it's not it's not just uh, somebody going on a fishing expedition, or it's not uh, people being targeted for reasons that are unfair. So. Um, the reality is the, the IT department can't do it alone. Uh, but let's, uh, you know, accept that and go on to what can the ID, IT department do to get visibility into what's happening in the network. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do this. And I think what's important about this subject is that each one of these technologies provides unique value. Um, there is no uh, solution that I've put up here that, um, that uh, comprehensively eliminates the need for one of the other things on this board. Uh, and so you've got to understand um, like each one of these uh, options that you have and what the, what the, va what the trade-offs are, what value it provides and what value it doesn't provide, uh, so you can decide what mix of, of tools you need. Uh, so um, I, I would focus specifically on, on SIM, uh, really syslog, NetFlow, and full packet capture. Um, so, and, and there are really four trade-offs. The first is recording everything versus only bad things. Uh, so uh, syslog 
um, t has a tendency to record um, only interesting things that happen in the environment. Um, Syslog is definitely important. Um, when I get into the specific cases, you'll see that almost every case uh, that is successfully investigated uh, was investigated as a consequence of log retention. Uh, um, and there's actually a whole lot you can do with SIM in terms of uh, correlation that's relevant to uh, some of the incidents that actually occur, and I'll show you that too. Uh, so it's really important. Um, but uh, it only sees some of the picture. And the other thing is that when a machine is compromised, you can't trust the syslog coming off of it anymore. Uh, so um, one thing you can do is, is full packet capture. Um, and and the, the trade-off between full packet capture and NetFlow has to do with breadth, breadth versus depth and time versus depth. Uh, so um, taking a look at this network, if you were going to deploy full packet capture, chances are you're going to deploy it here. Uh, and so you're going to see things leaving the network going to the internet. Um, and, and that's a specific kind of visibility. Uh, but you're not going to see activity happening down, um, down here. Uh, if you collect NetFlow, you can collect NetFlow from all of the routers and switches in this environment, and you can see every network transaction that occurs. So you can see these computers communicating to each other as well as stuff going out to the internet. But NetFlow is just a transactional record. It's just giving you to and from addresses, and metadata transferred, uh, whereas full packet capture is giving you everything that occurred. A lot of guys from a, from a forensic standpoint, especially when you get into the type of people that are uh, actually prosecuting cases, they, don't, they, they like that full packet capture because they, they have a complete picture of everything that happened. Uh, and so it's a trade-off. Do you want to have a lot of depth, uh, which you can probably reasonably afford to get here, or do you want to have a lot of breadth, uh, but not that depth? Um, or maybe you want both. Um, the other issue is the disk space required. Obviously, you can store uh, more uh, of, a, of a more compressed format than, uh, than full packet capture for a given investment in disk. And so the consequence of this trade-off is that um, is, is really time. Uh, you may be able to afford to, to store four days of full packet capture, uh, but you, maybe you can afford to store a year of NetFlow. Uh, so you got to, again, decide depth versus the amount of time. Um, the, the other issue, I brought this up before, is, is, is privacy. Uh, if you're storing full packet capture, um, or you're storing uh, uh, you know, NetFlow, or you're storing uh, Syslog, you're storing a lot of sensitive information about what happened in your organization, uh, what people were doing in the office. Um, and there may be PII or other, other information that people work with that's considered sensitive that gets stored in those systems. Uh, so you have to ask a couple questions. Uh, first is, is, is that system potentially uh, subject to being compromised itself? Uh, does it have valuable things on it that people would go after? Secondly, who in the organization has access to that data store? And in what context are they accessing it? And why are they accessing it? So um, again, those are, those are questions that are important to have good answers to. Uh, if you start collecting data and you, you let anyone use it for whatever reason, then it can quickly become a problem. So here's a couple open source tools. Uh, um, if you haven't played with either of these uh, kinds of solutions before, uh, you can, and sorry, these aren't necessarily open source. So Splunk's not open source, but it's free. You can download it and play with it. Uh, um, the Mandiant Highlighter is an interesting log analysis tool that you can download for free and play with. Uh, um, uh, Silk and Yaf are uh, NetFlow tools that, that CERT makes uh, that you can download and uh, very quickly start collecting NetFlow and play around with it. Uh, so it's a good way to sort of get a, is to put your foot in the water and see what you can do with some of these, these, uh, these technologies without spending any money. So uh, let's talk about these malicious insiders uh, and what uh, kinds of crimes uh, they commit. Um, so the CERT uh, data set, uh, they, they sort of organized all of the cases into four primary categories, three of which are, are relevant. One of them is IT sabotage. So IT sabotage is a situation where somebody actually breaks a computer system or destroys data. Um, tip, and I'll, well, I'll get into the typical characteristics in a minute. A fraud is a situation where somebody is stealing information uh, because they, uh, they want to sell it. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, usually uh, specific kinds of data like, uh, like credit card numbers, or maybe they're manipulating information within your database uh, in order to generate some profit for them. Uh, theft of intellectual property is, is either typically either like an engineer walking out the door with source code or um, some sort of other engineering plans, uh, or a sales guy with a bunch of customer contact information that he leaves with. Um, each one of these three uh, sort of arch typical cases uh, has um, certain characteristics that apply pretty consistently across the data set. Uh, 
So IT sabotage is typically um, a, a consequence of someone who's a former employee. So um, they were either terminated or they quit. Uh, they are a technical person. To, often they have like root access to something, uh, uh, and and they're they're disgruntled. Uh, often they logged in um, using someone else's account after hours uh, in order to do what they were uh, they were doing. Um, the uh, uh, the context of financial gain is is extremely different. These are people who the, the these are typically people who ha are low level employees, if you will, uh, clerks, people who are doing data entry, uh, and they've got access to some piece of sensitive information as a consequence of their job. Uh, they're uh, you know entering in uh, um, people's credit card numbers and they start writing them down on a p pad. Often they're pressured by outsiders to provide information. Um, uh, they're usually not very technical, and they usually do their do their, their they commit the crime at work during normal hours. Uh, um, the uh, theft for business advantage, the theft of intellectual property. Again, I, I sort of explained that it's either like an engineer or sales. Um, again, it's while they're currently employed, uh, they they use their own access to uh, to steal a large amount of data that um, you know they then try to sell to somebody else. Um, so understanding the profiles of these three different uh, uh, kinds of crimes enables you to focus your what you're doing from a detection standpoint, so that you can specifically, uh, 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 you know, identify this kind of stuff happening. Um, so, uh, fraud it may be one of the more challenging um, uh, uh, categories of the three, and so I'm going to start with that. Um, uh, of course, there are things you can do uh, on the prevention side: tight role-based access control, uh, auditing of database accesses, and uh, really having checks and balances in your processes. Uh, we see organizations that do a lot of uh, sensitive data entry build processes where there are multiple people involved in each transaction uh, so that if somebody is doing something incorrect, somebody else will hopefully catch it, and they all have to collude with each other in order to create a problem. Uh, and so from a, from a network monitoring standpoint, like what can you do to, to detect fraud, um, there's, there's not an awful lot. Uh, often uh, fraud is something that's occurring at a higher level in the application. So you may be able to detect uh, certain kinds of fraud by monitoring syslog. Um, the, uh, uh, but one thing that can happen is that, uh, so, you know, maybe there's three people that have to collude in the process in order to uh, commit an act of fraud, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a couple different people's passwords so I can go through and move a transaction uh, all the way through on my own. And so if I'm accessing uh, the database uh, from my IP address using different accounts, uh, that's definitely an indicator uh, that something may be happening. So uh, this is the kind of correlation that sims are really great at. They can say, you know, Bob is logged into Active Directory from this PC, and then, uh, you know, we saw Jane, Carol, and, and Sam uh, on the database getting authenticated to from that machine. Uh, sim will pick that out for you. Uh, uh, network behavioral profiling. So uh, people who do data entry typically have a very uh, sort of clear-cut set of things that they do on the network with their job. Uh, and so you can really lock down their PC. You can throw uh, app whitelisting on it, and, and chances are it's not going to frustrate their ability to do their job. You can um, you know, do really strict anomaly detection on the network that they're on, and you're not going to have a whole lot of noise because they're not doing anything except uh, you know, using this database tool every day. Uh, so it becomes a really easy environment to identify anything that's really suspicious going on because it's, it's not very noisy. So let's talk about theft of intellectual property. Um, in certs data, uh, there's this key window 30 days before and after resignation or termination uh, when this typically occurs. Uh, most of these people are not uh, necessarily brilliant uh, um, in terms of how they're exfiltrating data. 54% uh, of certs cases uh, um, involved exfiltration over the network, mostly email. Uh, uh, email with large attachments to third-party destinations. It's amazing how many cases in their data set involve people sending the data to the email address of the, at their new job. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, it's really easy to monitor for that kind of thing. Um, the, uh, uh, another thing, obviously, that people will do is print documents out. Uh, so, um, it may be, so again, you can't monitor, like, people printing documents. That's, that's not going to tell you anything useful. It's endless noise. But if you know that this person is quitting and you know they're disgruntled and their manager's kind of uh, worried that they might walk out with some data and you go look uh, and you see that, that their PC has been sending a large amount of data to the printer, then that might prompt you to investigate a little closer. I've, we have a customer that went through this exact process and they, they looked at their printer and the printer was one of those printers that stores the last 10 documents that was printed and it turned out that it was a bunch of confidential information uh, and they were able to you know, prove that the guy was trying to walk out the door with a bunch of stuff. So 
um, you know, that, that actually happens. Um, this, uh, this is a Splunk rule that CERT wrote uh, that, that, they, uh, that they published in their book. And what it does um, is it looks for accounts that are terminated in Active Directory, because the AD will send a log message to the, to the SIM saying, hey, I terminated an account. Uh, and, uh, and then um, it cross-references that with the mail server and sees if that person has sent an email with a large attachment uh, in the past 30 days. So it's just a way of like automatically outputting data that you might want to go double check when someone quits uh, to see if, if right before they quit they were like emailing a bunch of data out somewhere. Um, the um, the uh, uh, IT sabotage cases is a little bit more interesting. Um, Checks and balances for sophisticated users, uh, just like in the case of fraud, uh, where it makes sense for multiple people to be involved in a transaction, you want multiple people to have root access to your systems. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's just a basic business control. Um, if one person has access to everything, you can have a problem. So the famous case is, is this guy in San Francisco who was like the system man for the city, uh, who I, I guess he, he, he got pissed off or he got fired or whatever, and he refused to provide the passwords back to the city. And so they actually arrested him, and he refused to provide the passwords until the mayor actually physically met with him. So the mayor went to the prison and met him and got the root passwords. I have no idea, uh, you know, what his actual motivation was, but that's the kind of stuff that can happen if you're not careful with that. Um, so um, again, it's like monitoring employees that are on the HR radar. These are people who are pissed off. Their boss knows they're pissed off. They're thinking of quitting, um, uh, you know, and they're and it's not just a normal situation where somebody's like, I want to go get a new job. It's it's a situation where someone's very disgruntled and and they they believe the organization has wronged them, uh, and. Um, uh, you know, there are things you can look for. Obviously, like um, a new account creation, particularly for a system administrator, is potentially an issue. Um, and I don't know, I could go off on a tangent here about the way that we monitor account access. So you've got this single sign-on solution sometimes in your environment, and it's used to create accounts. Uh, but obviously, it's possible to create accounts on any system in the environment that is not managed by the single sign-on solution. So a lot of people think they can monitor SSO, and they can see every access that's happening in their environment. But it's really easy for somebody who's an administrator of a system to create an account that's not a single sign-on account. And then they can access that system without, without um, you know, being logged by the SSO. Uh, and so those are the kinds of things you got to think about when you're when you're uh, trying to create um, uh, some controls around this. Uh, you see um, access after termination. Um, so another good story from the CERT data is this guy uh, who um, you know he's he's at work. Um, they they terminate him. They lay him off. They go and they pull his account out of the Active Directory, uh, and he goes home and he's despondent and he gets drunk. Uh, and then, you know, that night, you know, at 11 o'clock or whatever, he's good and, 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 and trashed, and he sits down on his laptop, and lo and behold, he's got an open session into the corporate network, because pulling someone's account out of the Active Directory does not terminate any active sessions that they have. Uh, and so he's logged in, and he just starts deleting things. And I'm sure he woke up the next day and regretted it, but at that time, the damage had been done. Uh, so. Um, a cert said that most of the organizations they surveyed did not have a business process for determining whether or not there were active connections at the time they terminated an account. Uh, so that's something to think about. It's not just pull it out of the AD. It's, is there any active session? Can I terminate those active sessions? What's actually going on? Um, so, um, so there's... So unusual access is relevant, and, and one of the problems here is that if you look at the cert data, a lot of these um, incidents occurred where the, the, the attacker did not um, use his own account. He either got somebody else's account or he made an account that he was going to use to come back in after he was fired. Uh, and so um, you can't just monitor this person, although if that person does log in after they were terminated, you've got a problem. Uh, um, you know, they, there may be other accounts that are used. And so you're really looking for anomalous access. And this gets closer to what I was talking about in terms of APT. Uh, it's, it's can I differentiate the legitimate use of this account from someone else who's using this account who's not the legitimate user? Um, and this is a pretty challenging problem. So CERT published this. Um, this is a, I think this is a, um, this is like an arc site rule, I think. I, I'm actually, I don't remember exactly what uh, that's for, but it's a sim rule that says if you uh, log in after hours using uh, um, you know, RDP or, or SSH or Telnet, uh, then uh, notify the system in. So they're just looking for after hours login. Um, the reality is that in a, in a big business, you got people traveling all the time. You got people like logging in at weird hours to do work. 
Um, this is extremely noisy. Um, I do know people who do things like this. I do know people who are targeted by APT who monitor uh, logins that, from, from weird geographic locations on a daily basis, and they do it manually. And they go check, is that guy on a business trip or is he here today? Uh, and sometimes you gotta get that, that granular with it. But I think that there's an interesting science problem here uh, in terms of, um, you know, maybe uh, you're gonna log in from weird geographic locations because you travel for business. And maybe you're gonna log in at weird times because uh, you're working late or something comes up or because you're traveling and so you're in a different time zone. And um, the other thing is that maybe you have a behavioral profile. There are things you access on the network every day uh, and you're gonna break that behavioral profile. Those things are not reliable. Uh, there's research out there about where people have tried to build them but they, you know, inevitably you do something new or do something different and the profile gets broken. So all three of those variables are really noisy. Uh, but, um, you, you know, I have a hypothesis that if I take all three of those variables and I put them together, uh, that if you violate all three of those variables, that, that, um, that that's more likely to be indicative of a problem. Uh, that that you, you are, in fact, at a weird time from a weird location and you're behaving differently than you usually do. Uh, um, that, that may be enough of a, a set of indicators that the list of things that you've got to go double investigate is not terribly long. Um, and so that's, that's uh, one of the things that, that um, I think would help in dealing with sophisticated targeted attacks. Um, uh, there are a lot of things that you can monitor for in terms of uh, looking for um, uh, you know, uh, compromises in your environment. Um, uh, you, you know, people, when they break into your network, they're gonna do some internal pivoting. They're gonna scan around to try to find resources that, they, that they're really looking for. They're gonna collect data to some sort of staging site and they're gonna exfiltrate it out to the internet. Uh, and you can detect that kind of behavior uh, and it makes sense to do so. Um, this is a screenshot from our product where you're detecting data exfiltration. The, the problem is that if you do all these things, the attacker will adapt to the things that you have done potentially. So if you're not doing, I mean, I definitely know of cases where all of these things were done on the network because they didn't have a control in place to detect them. Uh, so it makes sense to have these controls. But if you have these controls, you might find that your attacker adapts and starts doing things that are more subtle. Uh, and so just as in the case of insider threat, you've got to narrow down the haystack by understanding who in your organization is at risk for doing that kind of thing. Um, you've got to narrow down the APT haystack a little bit as well. And, and that's what... Uh, um, th that's really where this incident response mindset comes from, where you're, um, where you're looking at actual breaches that occurred in your environment, you're investigating them, uh, and, and you're, you're, um, you're using the, the lessons you learned from those investigations to understand where these guys come from, exactly how they operate, what they're targeting, uh, and, and then you're looking for those kinds of behaviors happening again in the future. Uh, and so it, it's useful to have uh, again, logs, the transactional records, the full packet capture, the NetFlow, the syslog, uh, so that you uh, can go back in time uh, when you find an incident and understand it better. So, um, you know, say you find a sophisticated attacker has infected a host in your environment, they infected it three months ago. Can you go back and understand what happened that day, what they accessed after they got in, how many systems that they've infected? Can you build that picture of the breach based on the data that you've collected? Uh, and then that may enable you to pick up different pieces of information that you can use to detect them again in the future. Uh, but without that, without those audit trails, without all that evidence, uh, it becomes very difficult to understand what happened. So um, a final note, and that is about pen testing visibility. There was a talk at, at B-Sides Atlanta in 2010 on pen testing visibility, and it was like, can I exfiltrate without getting caught by their, uh, by their um, DLP? And the answer is yes, right? Uh, it's pretty easy to exfiltrate without getting caught by DLP. Um, and, and so often pen, people take this approach to pen testing where they're like, uh, as long as I can demonstrate that I can do it and they didn't catch me, then I won. Um, and, and my point here is that you've got to be a little bit more focused than that uh, in order to really provide value for your client because um, uh, the reality is, going back to what I said about deterrence, you don't have to be 100% effective at this stuff in order to create a, uh, um, a, a situation where um, you know, people understand that they might get caught if they do it and so they choose not to. Uh, and so um, it's important to consider, you know, what kind of controls they have in place, what they consider to be relevant, and, and, uh, and, and basically target your, your pen testing so that it identifies uh, uh, weaknesses that they, that they don't think that they have. Uh, you know, what, what, what is it that they, that they believe that they can catch, and can they really believe, catch the things they believe that they can catch, instead of asking, is it possible for me to covertly exfiltrate data in some way you can't see? Because I think that that's a hole with no bottom. Um, it is possible to exfiltrate data in a way that, that any detection system is going to miss. Uh, 
So um, it, with that said, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I, I guess I do I have time for questions? Two minutes. So if anyone's got a question, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, you. Yeah, so um, uh, just as you can learn from the incidents that affect you, um, uh, you know, those guys who have done forensic investigation of other sophisticated incidents are gonna come to you with some threat intelligence that's re relevant to those incidents. And in fact, um, it's not like everything is specifically crafted for you unless you're a really juicy target. The fact is that there's like different crews and they're breaking into a number of different organizations and so they may have, um, the, they may use the same tactics in different places and also they, they're very unlikely to send stuff that's really special at you unless they find that you're a really tough nut to crack. And so um, chances are they're gonna start with stuff that's more mundane. Uh, and so um, the, even the APT1 disclosures that happened like in February, um, uh, you know, we, we've seen people who took that data, even though a lot of that data was old and had been traded, you know, privately for a long time. Uh, that was the first time that a lot of organizations that have that problem knew about that those indicators, and they were able to use those indicators with against their logs, against their NetFlow, against their packet capture to identify those infections that happened in their network at some point in the past. And knowing that is is useful, even if you know clearly the adversary has is no longer using any of that stuff, right? They're, they're, they're not gonna use any of those command and control systems anymore. Uh, if you know that, that like in February of 2010, uh, I was talking to that command and control system. I now know that I was attacked by APT1. I, 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 I can assume that I'm still being targeted and I can maybe go back and try to build what was happening at that time and get to uh, some sort of understanding about what, what's happening in my network now. So yes, absolutely that stuff's useful. You had a question. Nice. It's interesting. No, I, I haven't done that that specific analysis. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes what happens is that you, you know, you're you're still logged in at home, and then you have some other machine that you've logged in. Yeah, yeah. You know, sorry, I don't I don't have a lot of additional insight on that, but it's a good question. So I, I agree. I think that, that one problem is that um, whether or not a third party or, or a business partner is an insider depends upon how you deal with them from an IT standpoint. So if you issue them uh, their employees access to your network then they're insiders from an IT perspective because they have the same kind of access to your environment that your employees do but if you've got some sort of portal and it's and they're firewalled off and they they have very constrained access to your environment then maybe you treat them as an outsider because um, because they're they're they, you know they're, they have to come in through some sort of perimeter in order to get to your, your environment and so that, that I think that's one of the reasons that that's fuzzy Okay. <laughs> all right, well, perhaps I'll, I'll consider a blog post about how to define that, thank you. Um, all right, so I guess, I guess that's time, right? So thank you all very much this for your time this morning.